You are now listening to the Big Beyond Belief Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. This is Leo Costa Jr. coming to you from BigBeyondBelief.com. We have a really good show today. We'll be talking with Sandy. Sandy, how do you say your last name? Du Bois? Du Bois. Du Bois. A nice little French name. Nice little French yes. name? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, Sandy, before we get started, uh, why don't you uh, give us a little bio, if you will, about yourself? Okay, well, I am uh, originally from New York. I've been out in California for the last 42 years. I am 62 years old. I have, um, I've been married for 38 years, and I have two adult kids, a 37-year-old daughter and a 35-year-old son and seven grandchildren from age 19 all the way to nine, um, six girls, five girls and uh, one boy, or six girls and one boy. And I live in Rancho Cucamonga, California. I am a natural competitor in women's bodybuilding. And I also do hair. I have my own studio. Okay. So, so with that being okay, uh, bodybuilding. Okay. So let me ask you now: uh, What age did you get into the uh, sport of bodybuilding? And before that, were you an athlete? I wasn't an athlete growing up, but when I was in high school, I started working out at a gym. They had opened the Jack Lanes, and I went and I was started working out there. And then I worked there for just a little season. And then when I moved out here, I joined gyms and I would work out, but nothing real, you know, intense. And then in the eighties, when Rachel McLish had come out, I had saw a magazine of her and I thought, Oh, I love that body. So I brought the magazine home and I told my husband, I want to look like that. So I joined a gym and took my kids there. Those days, they didn't even have childcare. So I talked the owner of the gym of, look, let me bring my kids. They'll sit right in front of the mirror. They won't do anything. And let me train. And he let me. And I wanted to compete. But in those days, uh, nobody taught you how to meal prep or, you know, how to really be prepared. So I just kind of let it go. I laid it down for a while. And then uh, nine years ago, I I would go to the gym off and on through the years. And then nine years ago, I went back to the gym and just started working out and doing cardio and the weight started coming off. I had put on a little bit of weight and, but nothing where you'd look at me and say, she's overweight. I just look normal and thicker. Yeah. And then, uh, one of my best friends said, you need to do cardio. So I was like, uh, okay. So that got me hooked. And then I, as soon as I went over to the weights, the muscle memory came back and I was hooked. Yeah. And um, that was it from there. Yeah. In the eighties, that Rachel McLeish was quite, quite something back then. I remember that, you know. I wonder mm-hmm. if she's still around. Do you know if she's still around? Uh, she's still around. Is that yes, right? Is she on live- social media, I follow her. Does she live in California, or where does she live now? I don't know where she lives, but she still looks good. Yeah, she so. was like the, you know, the per- a lot of people felt like you did, you know. And I remember in the uh, 80s like that, uh, the, the sport, you know, listen, the sports change. And it's always going to change. But especially, I think, for the, the women, um, you know, back then when I was competing, I remember the in the shows it was like um, a mixed uh, posing or mi- mixed couples would uh, would would uh, uh, compete, and but they never really at that time, as I remember, they never really had just a you know a spot for the women. I I don't think they were really sure uh, which direction that they wanted to go, and but Rachel at that time was as she seemed to be the gold standard and a lot of people wanted to as you mentioned wanted to be like her you said that the um the bug bit you it's interesting because you said the bug bit you after doing cardio for a while it wasn't that you it necessarily bit you because of the the weight training is that what you mean no no what happened was is 
I started losing weight so quickly with the cardio, and then I went right over to the weights, and my muscle memory came back because okay. I was losing, you know, the the thickness that I had. Yeah. And I was hooked because I saw how quick my muscle came back. Yeah. I had the time now and the energy. My kids were grown and gone, and yeah. so I was like, and I started building muscle so fast that I was like, I definitely want to do this. When you started, so, when you started training, though, were you getting any guidance uh, from anybody, or did you just walk into the gym and kind of figure this thing out on your own? How did that work out for you? Well, I had remembered what I was doing from years ago, but um, so I just stuck with that. And then at, probably about six months later, this uh, man walked over to me and he was a trainer and he had said, hey, are you a pro? And I'm like, pro oh, what? And he said, competitor. And I go, oh no, I'm too old for that. And he says, well, I can, uh, I can get you ready if you want to compete. And I was like, I'm in my fifties, man. So I set up a meeting with him and uh, he wanted me to come and train with him at like five in the morning. And I don't see five in the morning ever. Yeah. So <laughs> that wasn't going to work for me. So I had decided, all right, this is something I could do. Let me find a trainer. So I went to uh, Zero Gravity Fitness, which is now in Claremont. They were in San Dimas at the time. And I spoke to Ryan Benson, and he said, uh, you have a lot of muscle mass, you look good, uh, give me six months, I'll get you on the stage, and we'll get you in women's physique. And at that point, that was when women's physique was just starting, they, it was the first show out. So uh, we got ready, uh, and I did my first show, and I took uh, top five, my first show out. So, and then I was hooked. I was like, every, I did a show every six weeks for three years. You gotta be kidding me. Every six every weeks? Every six weeks. Holy crap. I can tell you that, you know, yeah. doing, you know, it, we were lucky, for me, I was lucky if I did uh, two a year, you know? Um, yeah. And to do one every six weeks and to be, I mean, you're basically peaked the whole time, you know? I, mean, I was peaked the entire time. And you said you did that for three yeah. years? Yeah, I did 13 shows in three years. And I my last three shows, I went into women's lightweight bodybuilding. Uh -huh. um, and every show, I uh, after the first show, I took uh, second. Uh, and every show except one, I took third. Yeah. So, so when you got into it, you got into it. That's for sure. I Yeah, that's <laughs> what, how I do everything. I get into it, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go. You know, I I, so. I guess, I you know, listen, I was pretty de dedicated to the sport. I mean, I hung around for about 15 years and competed. But, you know, for to be honest with you, for me to think that I wanted to compete every six weeks, nah. I wanted the off-season, you know. I like the off-season, and I like to eat. And, and I, I was willing to suffer for about, I mean, as far as dieting, uh, for maybe three or four months, you know, but I needed to take a break from that. So I, that's amazing that you had that much uh, uh, discipline to do that because I know exactly what it takes to do it just for a couple times you a year, do. let alone, you know, for doing it every six weeks for 13 years. Is that what you said? No. Oh, I thir did 13, 13 shows. shows. Yeah. Yeah. In three years. And the only reason I stopped was because I had. Uh, blown out my left hip you know after a while you know yourself that you do heavy weights and I was doing uh, you know 600 pound leg press you know once a week yeah. every week that I blew my hip out so it started hurting and I had to stop doing so much heavy weight and then got to the point where I needed a full hip replacement yeah. so the show that I was prepping for was um, five years ago. So, and I had hip replacement, I think three years ago now. Yeah. So that stopped everything. I still trained every day. Um, I just didn't do my legs for about eight months. Yeah. And then I had the hip replacement and I was back in the gym in a week. Yeah. Um, so, let me ask you, the, the, are you still working with the same trainer? You said you hired, hired a male uh, trainer. And are you still training with him? Yes. Okay, so you guys have had yes. quite a long relationship. Um, did you get or have you gotten much feedback 
to be in the sport that you're in as a female? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I get a lot of feedback. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, my age. Uh -huh. uh, I don't look my age. I look great. I'm very healthy. I inspire people. Um, I get a lot of positive. And then I get some looks because I don't look like the normal, you know, woman walking around these days, and especially, an, you know, mature woman. So, uh, but I get looks, sometimes I just get like, you know, and then I, just, I smile and try and be approachable. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, it's very positive. Yeah. So the, uh, it's really kind of funny because I know when I was doing my thing too, it's like, you're not going to please everybody. And there's so many people that have so many different opinions about what they see, you know, even to the point where right. I was blown away one time when I was like, I was in, in shape, ready to go on stage. And somebody came up to me and said, man, you look skinny. I'm thinking, oh, my God. I mean, at this point, I'm weighing 250. Oh, no. I'm 250 pounds. But it's just that's how they perceive me. You know, it's really that to me was, OK, this is interesting how people really might look at at you. You know what I mean? You just you don't know. And this then the the uh, response is so vast and interesting and I don't know about you, but I just learned kind of at that point, it's like, you know, I really have to do this for myself and not be too concerned about what other people mm -hmm. think because because of those reasons, you know. Um, right. Now, when you were training in the gym, you were, were you, I'm assuming that you said you were training heavy. Were you pretty intense? Because the reason I'm asking the question is because I, I have to tell you, you no, know, I'm still a, a member at Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, and I've been there on and off since the 80s. I trained with Platts. But, you know, Sandy, the the uh, atmosphere in, in the gym today at Gold's Gym is awful in terms of intensity or any kind of seriousness, you know. It just it's turned into a kind of a, I don't know, man. And so when you train, are you still, do you train intensely? Or how's that, you know, what what is it for you? Well, I train six days a week, and I still train very intense. Um, I have my headset on, and most people in the gym know me, and they know, if, you know, don't come up in the middle of a set. Uh, if I'm in between a set, I usually pace. I want to catch my breath, you know, and I'll say hi. But I'm not there to socialize. You know, sometimes when I get there, if I have, a, you know, a few minutes, I'll, you know, say hi to some people and chat for a minute. But yeah. I'm very intense. Yeah, uh, I used to have a shirt that said, don't talk to me. And I was serious because, you know, when I first started and people would come up and go, oh, hey, hey. And I'd look at them like, what are you doing? Like, go away. Yeah, so, I know. I know that. So that intense. But it's really weird because, you know, that's kind of what I was used to in, in back in those days. It was, it was intense, man. You were there to, to get some work done. But anymore, uh, you know, at least at goals. I mean, it's just it's it floored me. That so many people are just taking selfies now, and you know it's about uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of them are just uh, they're more concerned about their social media uh, posting than right. they really are. Um, you know, as far as making it kind of a serious deal, which is really interesting for me. Um, six days a week. Do you train? Um, your breakdown of how you're training is it mainly free weight? Do you have like a certain percentage of machine and and uh, you know? and cable uh, workout or do you just do mainly I, free weight i no, i do all of it i start with um free weights and then um usually go to cable and then i'll go to hammer strength uh machines and then sometimes i'll go to the other machines so you do it in that uh, order I do cardio do you do it in that order What's that? do you do it in that order free? yeah okay every single time is there a sometimes i switch it up yeah is there a yeah, particular, some, is sometimes, there, go ahead. Sometimes I'll just say, I'm going to start in the cables. It just depends. Yeah. But do you have like a routine that's set out for you each time that you go in or is it, or is it instinctive? Both. I have it uh, written out for each body part. I do one body part a day uh, and then I do legs twice a week. Sometimes I do back twice a week. Um, and it's some of it's it's all written out, and then sometimes I'll follow that. And a lot of it, I'll walk in and I'll go, "What do what do I feel like training today? What is my body telling me?" Yeah, you know, I, and that's how I've been training lately. I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, I usually like 
Uh, Mondays would be back, Tuesday would be legs and then so forth. But then other days I'll go and I'll go, eh, I don't want to do that. I'll do this. Or I'll look at my body and go, oh, I want to work on that part. Yeah. And that's kind of a hard thing to do because what you're ta talking about is actually being more in instinctive and intuitive um, and making that call sometimes when you go in. I know Tom Platts was that, that way as well. And that, that for me, that was pretty hard because I, I seem to uh, have a tendency of being more regimented. And, you know, I think that being too regimented sometimes gets in the way of what you're talking about because you go in and you think, no, wait a minute, just because I'm, you know, used to doing this as a routine doesn't necessarily mean that that is what I should do. And that's what kind of what you're doing. That takes a lot of, uh, I think that takes a lot of confidence to do that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I also, I want to listen to my body and I want to switch it up because if you do the same thing and start with the same thing, you know this, every time your body's not going to, you know, react like you want it. You know, if you go in and then I'll start with curls and, you know, and then I'll do, you know, triceps. Your body's like, oh, yeah, I already know that. Mm -hmm. you know, you switch it up and even start with something that you, even if you're doing your bicep workout, start with, you know, one of the uh, exercises that you would have done last, yeah. you know, just so your body doesn't go, uh oh. Yeah. You know. How many sets per body part do you normally do? I do four to five sets instead of uh, 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. uh, on legs, it's, it's a lot more. It's usually uh, four to five sets, 15 to 25 reps. Okay. Because I'm trying to build my legs more. Yeah. So you're saying you're doing four to five reps for the whole workout, or is it just four to five reps for? Four to five. I mean sets. I mean, sets. Okay, for the whole workout. So so how long right. does, how long does your workout take to get done? Uh, it takes me about ninety minutes. Okay, so I'm a little bit I'm a little bit I'm misunderstanding you. Four or five sets. Okay, so if you're doing curls, for example, do you do four or five sets of, for example, a barbell curl and then four or five sets of a dumbbell curl, four or five sets of a hammer curl? Yes. Okay, because I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think for what the audience might be thinking. Okay, so you're telling me four right. or five sets for 90 minutes. Uh, you're, you're actually talking about there's, you're doing different angles, different, you know, dumbbells versus barbell. Yes. Yes. So the total sets yes. in the day, like for your arms, how many total sets do you think you would do? I'll do five to six different exercises. There we go. And four sets of 15 to, uh, or 10 to 15 reps per uh, exercise. So I'll do, you know, the four sets of uh, 10 bicep curls, I might go to the barbell curls and then I'll go to cable yeah. and, you know, use the bar with that. I'll go to, you know, hammer strength and do preacher curls. Yeah. Um, and that, so forth. That makes sense. Um, do you mainly do volume type training? Like what you're talking about, 10 to 15 reps is what's considered volume. Um, do you do primarily just volume? I know you said you had a hip done so you couldn't lift as heavy. But do you ever switch that part of it up? Do you ever do, you know, maybe you train differently now, but did you do heavy lifting and then some volume training or has it always been volume? It's always been volume. And what I do is I graduate the weight. So I'll start, like if I do curls, for uh -huh. example, I always warm up and then I'll do, uh, the first set will be uh, 15 pounds. The second set will be 17 and a half. The third set will be 20. The fourth set will be 25 or 27. Yeah. You know, I used to go as high as 35, but uh, I don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. So you graduate. Um, interesting. You said that you, right. warm, you warm up. You know, one of the things I learned when I went back to years ago, I went back to the East Block and trained with the Bulgarian uh, lifting uh, national Olympic team. And I got a lot of my information when I wrote my first book uh, from them. And one of the things they talked about was that warming up was a waste of energy, which blew my mind because, you know, I came from the kind of like what you're talking about. It was so many, I warm up a little bit and then you get into the working set. But one of the things that was really interesting about what they, they I learned from them was how you can teach your body not to have to warm up. It, it basically, your body's adapting to its environment. So if you teach it that you need to warm up, then that's what it's going to do. And yet I learned over right. time that I didn't need to warm up anymore. 
which cut my, my training sessions down because one of the things that they talked about, and I want to ask about overtraining because 90 minutes, like you, when you're, are you talking 90 minutes of actual just the weight training? Not inc- that doesn't include cardio, right? Uh, no, I do cardio first thing when I wake up. Okay. I have a, a small spike. Yeah, okay. So they were, the you know, what I learned was that the way your physiology works is that when you train past 45 minutes, especially an hour, you you have the uh, the possibility of overtraining the body based on the way your physiology works and responds. So did you ever feel like and when you train like that, do you ever feel like you're overtrained? I don't feel like I'm overtraining because what I do is probably different than a lot of people is I rest longer in between sets. So I'll do a, a set of curls and then I'll pace back and forth. What does that and mean? And then I'll go back. How and many minutes are you resting? A walk. How many minutes do you rest? Um, probably, probably a minute in between each set. Okay. And then, yeah. uh, and then you come back to that set, and just, so every about every minute or so, you're you're doing a, a set. Right. Okay. And you still you know, there's have there been other than your your hip, have you dealt with many injuries? Um, nothing from the gym, or uh, but I have um, carpal tunnel. I had surgery last year on my right hand right here. Mm-hmm. Um, and that healed instantly. Like I went back to the gym the next day wow. um, and my little cast on yeah. uh, and they're getting ready to do my other hand. And that's mainly from work and aging and so forth. Uh, but it's never stopped me. But aside but from that, you haven't had other than that, no injuries or anything like that. Even when you were, no, I have, go ahead. No, go ahead. Even when what? Well, even when you were competing in those in those uh, during that time when you were competing every six weeks, you didn't have to. You didn't deal with any injuries during that time because at that point you're, you know, I don't know about you, but you know you're at a peak uh, condition. You're kind of, uh, you know, you're a little bit overtrained just because of, uh, um, of uh, you know the, what you're doing there. But I, you know, so no injuries then. I didn't have any injuries when I was competing. Um, I have scoliosis. Uh, I've had that all my life, uh, and it's really bad. But um, I work around it. it. I don't really have any pain. Okay. Uh, I went to a chiropractor about three months ago because I was having an issue with my shoulder, and he wanted to do X-ray, so he X-rayed my whole back and stuff. And then he takes me into the, you know, show me all the you and I already know what it looks like. And he says, um, does your back hurt? And I said, not really. And he says, uh, I don't even want to treat you. He said, because the way your scoliosis is, you really shouldn't even be walking. You should be in a wheelchair. He said, so I'm not going to touch you. He said, so keep doing whatever you're doing. Keep lifting heavy, do whatever you're doing because you're doing it right. So that's what I do. Um, I have uh, bicep tendonitis in this arm, but I've worked around that as well. And just, I don't, yeah. I don't let any pain stop me. Um, and, and I won't let it get me down. Just, I can't. Yeah. You know what it sounds, so. what it sounds like, what you're talking about is that your body has adapted to its environment. And I think if that's what your yes, chiropractor is saying, and he doesn't want to mess with that because you know, that, that's almost worse if he does that. And, right. and the other thing that, that you're talking about, and I think sometimes, listen, it, it, there's no question in my mind that in order to do this sport, you have to have a mindset that is just equal to none, you know, to get through that because right. you got to be willing to, perfect willingness to walk into the gym and basically put yourself through hell yeah, each and every time. And, you know, that, that certainly develops that's either going to make or break you because you know who, who in the hell wants to go into the gym and uh, inflict torture upon your body and you know and to keep going back for more it's really you know i sometimes i think about that and it's almost insane and i think that drives some people some of the in that sport i think it drives us crazy a little bit you know because you're driven by that i mean i remember a time it was like about 10 days out from a show 
that uh, I got hurt really bad in a hamstring pull. And there was no way that that was going to keep me out of the show. Even, you know, even if I couldn't uh, walk 100%, it was not going to stop me. It's like you just, nothing's going to stop you. And yet, I can tell you, I had, I had some strokes that stopped me pretty good uh, wow. for a little while. And, but even then, it was like, oh, I came back, uh, you know, sooner than anybody, you know, normally would. But it does take that. Well, and that's of, because we're healthy. That's why. Yeah. yeah. That's why. And uh, interesting. <laughs> um, you, you said you do cardio in the morning. Um, do you do, how much cardio do you actually do? And do you, how many days a week? Okay. First, let me tell you, I hate cardio. I hate it. Yeah. But um, I do fasted cardio. So I get up in the morning. I take my uh, minerals, uh, my greens and a shake. And I get my coffee and I go on my, I have a little encumbered bike. And I do that for 30 to 45 minutes every day. And when I first started doing it, it was, um, my trainer had said to do it because it was going to help. Um, cause I was prepping for a show, which we could talk about that in a minute. And, um, I was like, ugh, I don't want to do that. But what I found is it really helps my lower back. So on the days that I don't like, then I thought I'm only going to do it like five days a week. So on the days that I didn't do it, my back was stiffer. So now I just do it as my morning wake up. You know, I do the bike, I grab my phone, um, do what, you know, I'm going to do on there. And then I start my day. Yeah. So when you were doing your, um, you know, in your off season, for example, were you doing cardio less frequently or more than um, when you're pre-contesting? You, so it's all the same. I always feel like I'm in prep. I've always trained like I'm in prep for a show. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I'm going to do a show, it's a little bit more intense. I'm eating more uh, and I'm, you know, adding a little bit more weight. Yeah, that's, and so forth. that's but, interesting you know, because normally – when you're uh, you're talking about pre-contesting, then you're actually saying that when you go to pre-contest, you're increasing calories and, and it gets even more intense. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yes. Yeah, interesting. Because for me, it was the opposite of that. It was like I did a off-season. Right. I was consuming a hell of a lot more calories, doing less cardio. And then when I decided to start competing, that's when I started slowly cutting. You know, and then I would cut all the right. way till about a month away from the, the show. And then I would eat up going into the show. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. That's what you did is right. what you, what worked for you. It's just interesting, right. you know, that you did it that way, you know, instead of, right. of uh, interesting. Um, and you, did you ever have to like how many um, what would you say? I know you said you're you must have been pretty close to competition, even in your off season. How far away in terms of uh, weight loss were you? Did you let yourself get out uh, before a, sh a show? Um, I never. I would say the most would be fifteen pounds. So you were the always most. you were, you were just really close the whole time. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. sort of the norm for? Would you say the females? Uh, I know, like with me, you know, back way back when it was about. Get as big as you can in the off season, and then you cut weight. The problem with that is that you ended up cutting a lot of muscle, you know, because you have so much fat to get off, you know. So that's when I started. Right, my, yeah. That's when I started learning yeah. to be about no more than twenty or twenty-five pounds away from the show, but you were even closer than that. Yeah, my trainer doesn't believe in you know doing a heavy bulk and then a hard cut. Yeah, he wants to keep me, uh, you know. I and fit, you know, I want to stay uh, tight all the time. Yeah. So when I do a show, it's not that hard to come down. Yeah. And make, that's actually makes it, more sense to do that. Yeah. It hurts coming down anyway to cut down and to, to lean out that hard. Yeah. It really hurts. And the older I get, the harder it is. Yeah. Um, and it's very stressful. I know that one of the uh, problems that, because uh, I've, over the years, I've trained not only bodybuilders, but <clears throat> athletes that were wrestlers. 
And one of the mistakes that they made, which is talking, it goes to your point, is that they would they would cut so hard towards the end that they actually went into the event weak. Uh, they had no st- right. stamina or endurance, and that happened to me actually at one of my shows. And you know, so I don't know, but I I, I felt so bad after or uh, doing one of my shows that um, I mean I I thought I almost killed myself. I think I was pushing so hard towards the very end, but I learned a, a great lesson. In fact, what happened to me was. I got. I was so depleted, and I started. I I pulled so much water out of my system for quite a few days before the show. When I got up there on stage, when I went to to hit a double bicep, I I couldn't I couldn't contract. All my electrolytes were shot. It was really a weird sensation. Yeah. You know? And I, did that ever happen to you? No. Yeah. No, because I've I've done it very health wise. Yeah. Uh, my trainer was at every show with me. Uh, in the pump up room and he would say, all right, you know, uh, I want you to eat this now or, you know, uh, so I've, I've always said, if I'm going to do this, I have to stay healthy. Yeah. And that's why you see what's happened is there's been so many of these young men and women bodybuilders that they're dying lately. Yeah, There's been a lot of them. And a lot is because of the way that they're, you know, they're like what we're talking about, training and eating and depleting and a lot about what they're taking. Yeah. So if you're not going to be smart about it and you just want to get up on that stage, you know, you might get up on that stage, but when you get home, you might not make it. What kind of cardio did you do? Do you have a certain machine that you like to use or did you mix that up too? Well, when I first started back at the gym, my best friend had me do the stair climber, which I hated. Um, but it worked because I lost a lot of weight. It wasn't a lot. I, I was like 30 pounds heavier. Um, but now I do the bike. It's a small encumbrant bike uh, and I don't have to hold on. So I could just sit there and do it. I've done the elliptical. That's okay. Uh, but And I don't like the treadmill. So Yeah. Yeah, the treadmill is my, well, that and the stair is my least favorite for sure. I'm I'm hooked on the I like the upright. I have an upright bike that I ride. It's funny how we get kind of used to and I do like ellipticals too, you know, but yeah, I like you. I don't I'm not a big fan of uh oh well, look, the whole thing, the the weight training and the cardio, I never was. It was like a love-hate relationship throughout my whole career. I didn't yeah. I didn't really love it. Like I didn't really love but I loved the feeling of it. I loved the result of it more than I actually loved yeah, and I look forward to go doing that. No, to be honest with you, I didn't. And yet I stuck with it for all yeah, these years. Know. I mean, and it's still, you know, it sounds like you're, you're as well. It's like a, you you get uh, addicted to this in a way that you, it becomes a part of your life and you just go in and do it whether you're feeling well or not. It doesn't really matter at this point, you know. Uh, and that's what kind of separates the people in the industry, you know, they're, there's the wannabes that kind of they come and go, and then there's people like you and I, who have been around forever, you know. So I think that that's a mark of a, I think of your uh, intensity and your discipline compared to somebody who thinks they want to go do this. So, so your cardio is pretty much right. the uh, this the recumbent. Is that what you said? It's a recumbent bike. Yeah, it's a small bike. It's low, and I could just sit and pedal. Yeah, I have my coffee on one side and my phone in my hand. There and you I- go. Good wake dis- up <laughs> good distraction um and then in the um when you were in uh how many calories a day would you say that you normally eat and does that change i know you said you increase your caloric intake as you go into a show so in this case how many calories do you eat a day before you go into the sh- uh, pre-contesting well i've never counted calories so i don't even know how to do that but i carb cycle so right now I eat 150 to 200 grams of protein a day. And I've always done that. So I eat a lot. And then uh, my carb cycle, it's a four day cycle. So it depends on where I'm at. If I'm growing, I'm eating more carbs. And if I'm leaning, I'm eating less carbs. So you don't, this is really interesting. You don't, I mean, I know to the nth degree how many calories I'm taking in protein and all that kind of stuff. Now, does your, does your trainer help you do that? Does he control your intake like that? Is that you, are you just simply just eating by, you know, how you feel and intuitive? 
Um, hope, I, I'll ask him. I Right now I go, I see him once a month. So I'll go train with him and I'm like, all right, what should I eat? And lately he'll say, you know what to eat. So, uh, and if, if I'm getting, you know, if I'm leaning out, like, you know, I'm going somewhere, um, I'll cut back on the carbs. Yeah. So like right now, normal, uh, what I do is 50 grams of carbs for three days. And then my fourth day is a high carb. It's like 150 to 200 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. And then I go right back to the, the first day, 50 grams That's of carbs. That's the cycle. So what's yeah. the point of all that, to a cycle like that? Well, the the point of that is you're you're doing your low carbs or your you know your regular carbs. When you do your high carbs, you're basically uh, spiking everything in you, and you're shocking your body. It's going, whoa, I didn't have all that. Yeah. And then when you go back to the low carbs, it pulls everything out of it. All the glycogen get you know comes out. Yeah. Uh, you you fill your muscles and so forth. But when I'm um, prepping for a show, it's higher carbs. It's mm -hmm. kind of like you, you're bulking. Yeah. So for example, uh, my last show, you know, a few months before my high carb, you know, he had me on 500 grams of carbs in it one day. That's a lot of food. So sure, all I would literally do is sit and eat yams, bags <laughs> of cooked yams and oatmeal too. It's like, I don't even know how I consumed it, but it fills your muscles, it fills everything up. And then your body's like, okay. And then when you go down to the low carbs, pulls everything out that doesn't need to be in there. 500 grams of carbs is 2,000 calories. I can tell you that. This is stuff that I'm really into. Okay. So 2,000 okay. calories of yams, that's a that's a lot of damn yeah. yams you got to eat. That's a lot. It really is. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that, you know, that people that are not in the sport don't realize. I mean, the sport is still based on extreme behavior. I mean, because for you to eat 500 grams – you know, uh, at 2,000 calories, all it, was it pretty much all at one time, or was that throughout the whole day? No, throughout the day. Okay, throughout the day. it was a lot. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'd be at work, and, you know, I do hair, so in between clients, I would have, because I meal prep, and I would take, you know, all these yams and cook it and have it in bags, and I would literally sit there and just take handfuls and just shove it down. I couldn't even think about what I was eating. And, you know, the salon I was at, all the girls were like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah. just don't, just don't even ask me what I'm doing. Just yeah, leave me alone. You don't want to know. Yeah. Uh, so based on that, then if you're eating 500 grams of carbohydrates, that's 2,000 calories. And you said that, <clears throat> excuse me, you were eating 200 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's another 800 calories. So right there, you're eating 2,800 calories uh, a day. How much? What was your grams of fat that you were taking in, or do you know that? Um, yeah, I know that. So uh, it was fifty grams of fat a that's, day. That's four hundred and fifty calories. That was yes, but that was one day a week. I would have to do that high carb, like every four days. Okay, so, so it wasn't every day. Yeah, so you were again. You would go from fifty grams, which is two hundred calories. Now, when you were doing that with the 50 grams, because that was the beginning of your carbs, your carb cycle or carb loading uh, is what you were doing. Right. Okay, so did your grams of protein stay the same or you just, did you keep that the same, 200 grams? That stayed steady or did that fluctuate with your carbohydrate intake? Well, it had, it only fluctuated on that high carb day because I couldn't eat anymore. I was like, all I was doing was eating carbs carbs yeah I couldn't get any more food in when he had first told me that one day he said all right you know this week you're gonna eat five. I literally cried <laughs> and then he had me do it another week and I go I can't I, I like grow up like I can't eat like this yeah and he goes you could do it I would literally at night before I go to bed I'd make a bowl a big bowl like a bowl that you would prepare you know to cook food in yeah like mixed food <laughs> of oatmeal, like two cups of oatmeal. Yeah. And I would literally take it and just shovel it. And my husband would look at me and I go, don't look at me. Yeah. Don't ask questions. Just And I would just tell myself, eat it. And I would just eat it. Like I would like this blank stare, like yeah. just eat it and I'd get it down. Yeah. But I don't want to do that again. It's kind of insane behavior. Yeah. And I don't have to do that again. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm, this is interesting because I never did the – your carb cycle reminds me of when I used to carb load. See, what I uh, did is I was on a high-fat diet and Monday through Friday, 
And then on the weekend, I would do carb loading. Um, so Monday through Friday, uh, my carbohydrate intake was 30 grams or less because the 30 grams or less, what it did is it flipped my metabolism over to a free fatty acid metabolism. So you have two different um, metabolisms within the body and the way you turn one on or one off is how many carbohydrates that you're taking in. Now, so it takes three days for your body to flip over to the uh, free fatty acid. So Monday through Friday, I would actually be on 20 or 30 grams of carbs. 56% of my diet was fat, and then uh, the rest was protein. So it was basically a high-protein, high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. But what I did it for was mainly to, to switch the metabolisms because I did better E on a, on a, I did better on fat metabolism than I did glucose, which is what your, uh, your glucose is your sugar diet. Okay, that's what your your metabolism based on the fact that you were taking in fifty grams, your body was in uh, glucose metabolism. Okay, so when you were carb cycle, yeah, when you were carb cycling up, that's when I was I would do a carb load on the weekend. I couldn't take protein in. I mean, it was just too much because at that point I was yeah, yeah I was carb loading. I was eating like ten thousand calories a day. And well, hell, you know it's hard enough just to get the all those carbs in. But I know what you mean. That sensation of putting carbs back in would fill the muscle up. And you'd be would I don't know about you, but would you be so tight uh, sometimes that you I, mean, I could hardly almost move when I had that many carbohydrates in my system. Did you get that that feeling as well? Oh yeah, I I feel it. Um, Every time I do it, like right now I'm doing, uh, I'm doing 50 for three. And then uh, the fourth day I'm doing about 100, 150. And when I carb load that day, I'm like, I'm like, I'm so tight. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a good so, feeling. You know, it would be so tight sometimes I can yeah. hardly move, move my arms. I mean, it was that, that kind yeah. of sensation. It's kind of weird. So when you were doing carb loading like that, did it, did it make you feel lethargic? Did you get lazy because of all the sugar? It's like a hangover when you take that 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 many carbs in. Yeah, I, my body actually works better with lower carbs. Yeah. Um, so when I was doing all the high carbs, and plus I was working and training, so you know I was just like, uh, you know, my I have a full time stylist that works for me. She's my assistant. Yeah. And she'd say, I get this big bag out, and I'd sit down. I go, I gotta eat. She'd like, go, <laughs> go, just go eat. You know, I take. Yeah, and so she's like, she's eating, leave her alone. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, so you didn't have too much trouble with uh, lethargy then, right, from eating all the carbs. I mean, did you have that? No, because I did. It was awful, no. you know, and especially like on the weekend when I was eating 10,000 calories. I mean, that was per day. Uh, so at 20,000 calories over the weekend, all I was doing was eating, and I was so, yeah, it, I was so, you know, taking that kind of sugar in, it's like a hangover. That's what alcohol is. It's a sugar hangover. And it was a nightmare. And the way that I controlled that, I learned, was to, when I carb loaded and added fat to my carb load, it smoothed that out. Because what it did is slowed that release into the body. It's kind of like the difference between a complex carbohydrate versus just taking in simple sugar. You know, I don't know if you had, right. did, did you ever, when you were carb loading like that, I know you said it was, it, did you have any fat when you were carb loading? Like, would you put butter on your yams or it was just straight yams? Oh. Yeah, no, I, when I was competing, I did no fat. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they have uh, competitors, they want you to eat good fats, avocado and peanut butter and stuff. But when I was competing, no fat. I didn't have fat for three years. Really? At all, like none. Are you talking zero fat, really? So you were just eating protein, lean, zero fat, protein, and carbohydrates. That's it. Yep. And what that was, was the, what was the thinking behind that? The thinking those days was behind that to keep you lean and tight, you know, and then he switched it up. I guess, you know, you keep learning and trying different things. Yeah. We need good fats, you know? So now, and I still don't eat a lot of fats just because I don't think about it. Yeah. You know, my basic diet is egg whites, oatmeal, uh, steak turkey and uh chicken yeah and vegetables that's it yeah you know once in a while eat some peanut butter and that to me is like a oh i'm cheating you know yeah eat peanut butter well and i think what you're talking about and is that and i 
look, we all have our, our ways of going ba- uh, about eating and getting a result. So the way what I'm about to share with you isn't necessarily better. It's just that that's what worked for me. But it's really interesting because <clears throat> the way you're talking is like you, the reason why you weren't taking in fat, and it, again, this is my opinion, and you can certainly correct me there. But what in the what you were thinking and the way you were eating was that the fat was the culprit. I didn't want to eat fat because I didn't want my body to put on fat. That's what it sounds like right. to me. Okay. And from my perspective and my and my training and what I learned, and again, I did you have you heard of a guy named Dr. Maro Di Pasquale? Um, I think you talk about him in your book. Yeah, he's him and I wrote the anabolic diet. Okay, and he does ketogenic, and so he knows all about that stuff, you know. And he's the one that actually came out and said, look, you're not a product of what you eat. And he made me understand that from a physiological perspective because when food breaks down, it breaks down into the same thing. It breaks down into energy, a unit of energy that produces heat to the body. Essentially, that's what ends up happening physiologically. So, you know, it, it's hard to wrap, it was hard for me to wrap my head around that but when when he broke it down like that, that made different kind of sense to me. And then and then he started, you know. Then I started learning how to manipulate the macros. For example, and this is what I mean about fat being really useful. The when you add fat to a baked potato, because you know a baked potato, as you I'm sure you know, it's very high glycemic. So if you just take a baked potato without butter. It breaks down into your body as fast as like candy does, pretty much. It's it's the mm-hmm. glycemic index value of that potato is very high. So you would get what you're talking about. You get a spike, but on the other side of that spike, you get a crash, okay? And right. it, unless you were constantly eating uh, carbohydrates, you're constantly dealing with this, I don't know about you, this roller coaster. I can feel my energy just going up and down. But the minute I started adding fat, to the baked potato, for example, then all of a sudden what fat does to the baked potato is it absorbs the sugar and the result of that is it slows the release of energy into the body. So you actually get more of a sustained energy to the body. That was how, you know, that's what I learned from that style of eating. So it really is interesting when I hear you say that you cut all your fat out of your diet, you know, and yet you were highly successful. And it just goes to show you mm-hmm. more than one way to skin a cat, you know? Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So, now, how long have you I, been... How I, long, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, how long have you been carb cycling like this? Eight years. And it's just like day in and day out. You haven't, you haven't gone off. It's just something that you just do the same every, every day. Um, no, I switch it up. I've gone off where I'm like, you know, I'm just going to, sometimes I eat what I want. You know, I like tacos and, um, I, ice cream. (laughs) Um, but I, my staple is, you know, what I eat. I eat clean. Um, and because I eat so clean when I eat stuff, I shouldn't, it, my body doesn't like it. My yeah. stomach hurts, you know, and so it's easier to just stay with where I'm at. And, you know, like yeah. I said, I'll, my cheat would be a taco. Like I went out the other night with my assistant and we had tacos for dinner and I didn't feel like, oh my God, I blew it because, you know, I'm basically not competing. So I don't have to stay so tight, yeah. but I like how I look. So I want to stay that way and I feel better. Yeah. Um, so, but I'll switch up the carbs. You know, sometimes I'll do more, sometimes I'll do less, uh, sometimes it'll just be steady, you know, yeah. I'll just stay with, you know, a couple of carbs a day and I'm fine. And then other days I'm like, oh, I'm going to eat more carbs today. Yeah. So I listen to my body and see how it feels. Yeah. One of the things that you were saying, this ha- this goes back to the body becomes its function and it's always trying to adapt to its environment. And the environment that you're talking about is, you know, if it, you're saying that when you go out and blow it and do a cheat maybe for too long and eat a different way that you don't feel your body hurts and it's, it gets upset, you know, and that the same thing happens, Sandy, when you're on a junk food diet, for example, you can put somebody on, oh, yeah. on a junk food diet and when the body adapts to that, 
when you make them eat and have them eat clean, they get the same exact feeling. And you would think that that wouldn't be the case, but that's, again, that is a, a good example of your physiology, uh, you know, and how it, it, it's always trying to adapt to an environment, and then you switch it up for the better, in this case, to eat clean, and yet for a, a while it takes for it to adapt to that scenario. It's just amazing right. what, what you can uh, get used to and you know and not everybody um, that eats like Sandy is going to get the same result as Sandy just like if I told people like uh, the way that I ate not everybody is going to uh, you know turn out to have the same result and this is another thing that's really interesting I think about this sport is that there's a certain amount of trial and error that you have to be willing to tolerate uh, to see how it actually works for you would you agree with that right Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And um, so, you, you know, that's that cracks me up. Uh, so how many calories then, um, uh, of course, you don't count your calories. This, blows, it, this really blows my mind. I have to tell you this. I'm, I'm, a, I'm that person that is, I, 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 the, my whole life depends and is based around a formula and a number. And yours really isn't, you know? And well, mine is, mine is, mine is, I count carbs. That's all I care about. Yeah. So How you, much carbs am I eating? That's it. And you don't care about your protein. Is that what you're telling me? Well, I care about my protein because I know I'm eating that. You know what I mean? That I eat protein every day. Yeah. So, and I eat a lot every day. So, uh, and I eat protein every meal. So it's, the thing that I just focus on now is, okay, how many carbs am I going to have? Oh boy. That's interesting. I love it. Um, uh, okay. So do you take any shakes at all or do you just eat food? Um, when I first started competing, my trainer didn't want me on any shakes. He's like, I've got fillers. I don't want you on any of that. And I was like, fine. So now I do, I take, um, one shake a day, um, in the morning after I have my egg whites for breakfast. Um, and then, um, then I have all my rest of my meals. So what's it? So, what's in your protein drink? Um, okay. I put in a scoop of protein, which is twenty-five to thirty grams, and then um, I also like muscle egg, which is a flavored liquid egg white, mm -hmm. um, and I'll put a cup of that in, and then some water, and that's it. So and I don't drink any milk. Okay, so your protein that you're taking in is it a milk and egg protein? Is it whey? What kind of protein do you take? It's whey. Whey. Yeah. Is it whey, whey, whey isolate yeah. or just straight whey? Whey isolate. Whey isolate. Yeah. And do you take that before or yeah, before your training session? Yeah, typically right before I train. Sometimes I take it in the gym with me and I drink it, you know, as I'm training. It just yeah. depends. Yeah. And what about, do you take any protein in the evening? So like a milk and egg or anything like that? I don't take a shake in the evening, but I eat up until I go to bed, which is usually about 11 or 12. So I'll eat right up until I go to sleep. Yeah. What do you think and about so right before I go ahead and finish? Um, sometimes I'll eat steak right before I go to sleep. Just depends on what I feel like eating. What do you think about, I had a um, interview with a guy named Carl Lenore who addressed this, but what do you think about the idea? Some people like I have this training, uh, personal training series now for a lot of years, and I work with a lot of clients. And of course, I was in the bodybuilding uh, arena, and I saw that side of it too. We always ate; we ate all the time. Ate, you know, at late at night. It didn't matter. And yet, so many people are advised by their doctors or whoever that you should stop eating at six o'clock at night. And I've never believed that. Um, although. You know, this guy that I was interviewing with, Carl Lenore, I, th I thought he made a pretty good point because he said that, you know, if you never shut, let your body, you know, if it's always trying to break down food. I think they call that autophagy, um, that your body can't really fully recover because it's always in work mode, you see. And um, but the bodybuilders that I hung around, especially when we're uh, traveling and I mean, you had to eat sometimes late at night, but it was like. Here's the way I looked at it. Your body needs so many calories a day to function, you know, and your body tells you if you're not eating enough because it'll drop weight. And so I never thought that that to be an issue. Have you ever, did, have, has anybody ever mentioned that to you as far as 
you eating that late at night? I've heard, you know, oh, you shouldn't eat past this certain time. And I'm like, well, I do. Working for me, you know. And one of my clients the other day, she goes, oh, um, you know, she's trying to lose weight. I go, okay, what are you doing? She goes, intermittent fasting. I go, okay, well, explain it. I wanted her to tell me, you know, and she's basically saying, well, you know, I don't eat from like eight at night till, you know, 10 in the morning. You know, and your body's supposed to have all this time to, like you're saying, recover and do all that. I'm like, okay, is it working? You know, and she said, uh, well, I started it a month ago. And I go, well, what have you lost? And she needs to lose some weight. And uh, she said, uh, five pounds. I said, in a month? (laughs) You know, so it ain't working. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I could lose five pounds in a week. Right. So, you know, it just depends. But... For me, if I don't, if, if I stopped eating at eight at night, I would starve by the time I'd go to bed. Yeah. You know, I would, I'd feel it. You know, I eat every two hours. So, and in two hours is when I'm like, I need to eat, you know, three. If I, and there's times I've missed it, you know, I'm working, so I can't. On that, you know, three hour mark, I'm like, I gotta eat. I'm getting hangry, you know, I'm shaky. Yeah. You know, my blood levels go in, yeah. you know, everything's dropping. So I have to eat. Yeah. And, and you know, Sandy, and, and you know, I, I, I want to bring my per, my perspective to this thing because, uh, you know, maybe like you, I'm always interested and in, I keep learning new stuff, you know, that, that keeps evolving, you know. And it's funny that you're saying that every two hours. And here's my take on that. Here's my and my my own firsthand experience, because I felt the same way that what you're talking about when as a bodybuilder, it was like uh, basic nutrition 101 was to eat every few hours. You know, that's why I, I lived and breathed by that. And yet I came across information not too long ago about how your body is actually more efficient if you eat fewer times a day. And there's a physiological reason for that. And that is because when your body is, is in between um, eating when it's sleeping, what happens physiologically is that your um, your liver and your pancreas secrete um, you know, enzymes, lipase. Uh, there's a few things that it, it, but they're all they're enzymes and they're bile. And the, when you eat fewer times a day, your body actually produces produces larger amounts of these enzymes and this bile. And the job of enzymes and bile is to it breaks it it's in your bloodstream. It actually breaks down any kind of fat. If you're storing any kind of fat like a triglyceride, because that's what your body does when it gets it when you eat too much, it has to do something. So it normally stores a sugar as a fat, as a triglyceride. Right. So when you're eating fewer times a day, you're getting larger amounts of bile and enzymes in your bloodstream. It goes up to the triglyceride, which is a fat, and it breaks it back down to, into free fatty, fatty acid, and now it uses it in energy again. So th- this, again, when I, when I hear about and learn about stuff like this, it blows my mind. But, you know, the physio- when it, physiology, it's hard to, um, you know, to go against how your physiology just, just normally works. But I think what you're saying more than anything else was that you've taught your body. For me, it's like you doing warm-ups before a workout. You've taught your body that you need to eat every two hours. And when you go past that, your body is so, it adapts so specifically to your environment that it lets you know that. You know, so, you know, is it, again, for those people that are listening to this, is there a certain way and a right way that you should be doing, and the only way that you should be doing this, no, because I think that what the way you're doing yeah. it is fine, and I also think that what from what I've learned, I inter- intermittent fast every day. I intermit, I do an intermittent fast every single day. I don't eat until I go back, uh, go at home at night, and I have my one meal, and I still train. I, I'm not training, you know, like I was intensely back when I was uh, competing, and I don't know that I would do that. If I was competing, but I'm just saying that at right. this stage of the game, for me, the intermittent fast works. And but it's just I don't know. It's just so fascinating to listen to people like yourself because you know you talk to five different people that are in the sport, and you're bound to get five different ways 
and that they swear by it, you know? Uh, so that's yeah. kind of, kind of takes... Everybody take, has their way. Yeah, and it kind of takes me back to my point that, you know, when you're living the bodybuilding lifestyle and and especially when you're competing and all that, you really have to make a commitment to the process to find out what really works, you know, because I had a guy, a buddy of mine, Don Ross, he, he told me before, he said, you know, Leo, everything works to a degree. It's just, and he was referring to training, it could you know, weight training, cardio, and nutrition, those components. But he said, it's a, it's a question of to what degree it works for you. And it made, a lot of, right. it made a lot of sense to me because it took a while, you know, for me to figure all that out. And then it started making sense um, as to why it does take so long for bodybuilders to get on stage to look really right up there. I mean, you're remarkable in that you started when you did and in the success that you've had, you know, and you're still you're still living that that uh, that lifestyle. My my one of my questions would be now, you know, after all these years, like I've been in it for 40 years. Um, are there any regrets, you know, that you got into the to this uh, sport or to this lifestyle? Uh, any regrets? No, nah. no. Nah. Yeah, I wish I would have uh, started competing years before, um, but none. It's all been very positive uh, health-wise for me. Um, when I had my hip replacement, it was a, a, a you know outpatient surgery. When you they get you up like an hour after the surgery and. The nurse comes in, she goes, okay, well, you need to get up and walk now. And I said, okay. So I, you know, put my legs to the side and I got up and walked. She's like, wait a minute, you need a walker. I'm like, no, I don't. You know, and I go walking down the hall. And <laughs> well, hold on there. <laughs> funny thing. And my husband's going, that's her, you know. So the, the nurse goes, well, uh, let me like tie a belt around you in case you fall. I'm like, all right. So she ties like this band around me so she can hold me like, oh, okay. like, hey. And they let me go home. I went home in an hour after that. So I was home in three hours after surgery. I used the walker at home for a week. Um, and I worked out at home. I had made a little gym. So the next day I went in, I did arms and stuff. I didn't stop. And then the second week I went back to the doctor and he says, you're released. He said, go do whatever you want. I go, what do you mean? He says, do whatever you got to do. He goes, you're free to do whatever you want. If it hurts, don't do it. He said, you are in the one percentile of people because I can't stop you. So I had physical therapy uh, three times a week. And then I went back to the gym with a cane. Uh, I used the cane and I went back to work two weeks later and Bada boom. perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, so it's helped me. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, and this, again, is in place to what you're saying, is that as a strength coach, because I do a lot of strength training, or I used to work with a lot of athletes, and one of the things that we learned about uh, training is that, and this goes to uh, training young young athletes, even prepubescent, uh, is that when you're an athlete like this, when you stay an athlete and you continue to train, when you have those moments where you're hurt, in your case, you, you were had an injury, the recovery rate is 50% faster for those people that are working out. And you know something that applies to a lot of people, not only athletes, but it also applies to my uh, women that I used to train that were pregnant. I kept, you know, once we got past the trimester, it was like, you know, you, you're going to work out. And you know something, those women yeah. that women that did that, when they had their baby, they were back and doing normal life and, I mean, at least 50% faster than the women that didn't do that. Oh, definitely. You know, definitely. So, so there's, I, I, I'm with you on that because, you know, um, bodybuilding and training is something that has saved my life, I think, especially yeah. after, you know, I have these strokes and I think that, uh, you know, people said, well, it's because you're bodybuilding. And, the, you know, at that point, uh, you know, I was, you know, carrying a lot of weight. I, it, it was the sport for me was based on uh, extreme behavior uh, to a degree. You know, I'm not going to say and say that maybe the, the training and all that didn't have a part because it was part of the extreme behavior. But the training itself and bodybuilding, I have to tell you something that sport has saved me in so many ways 
because it helped me recover mm-hmm. from being paralyzed. It helped me with a mindset that helped me deal with life because life kicks your fucking ass at times. Pardon my French it Dubois. Uh, yeah. it, it does. And you know something? If it wasn't for that sport, that sport gave me nothing but a life lesson that I use every single day. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy. Yeah, it's true. It's one of the best things that's ever happened into my life. And I'm I'm so lucky that I found bodybuilding in the in this lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I agree a hundred percent. I it's I know for me, uh, it's saved my my body. You know, if I wouldn't have been training like I do, and I needed hip replacement. I don't think I would have recovered that quick or anything. You, you know? wouldn't. You wouldn't have. Um, no, you wouldn't have. No, you know? I wouldn't have. No, the, your training no. and your mindset it, it made you heal faster. You were back because of that reason, you know. Right. And maybe because that you were lifting all that weight it was part of the reason why the hip, you know, you had the issue. But there's a, it's a. Well, yeah. You know, but still, that this I, I talk about this in my in my stroke book. The, you know, the thing that almost took me out is what saved me. And that's kind of a weird thing because, you know, the, the sport, true. it is true, you know, and I guess maybe the, the lesson there and the life lesson there is just, uh, you know, it's like you just have to figure out how to make things, how to use uh, adversity to your benefit, you know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like what I did. It sounds like that's what, that what you did, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, listen, I think this has been a, a very interesting um, talk. Is there anything else that maybe you'd like to mention? I mean, I asked you some questions and, you know, trying to, to see this and, you know, for our audience, maybe what they would ask. Is there anything that you'd like to, that I didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? Um, no, I would just encourage um, anyone that's watching or listening that uh, it's never too late and you don't have to get to the extreme that, you know, that we're both at, just get in the gym. I don't know. I could be out anywhere. I'll be at the bank or at the grocery store or anywhere. And people come up to me and they'll, they'll say to me, uh, I, I ate good today. Like, Hey, I'm not your diet priest, but okay. (laughs) Like, all right. You know, or like, I I need to work out. I'm like, do it, you know? And it's never too late, you know? And I just want people to know you could, you know, can inspire others, you know, and if you want to go to the gym, get in there. Don't be afraid. Yeah. And you don't have to go in there with this huge goal. Go in there and say, I'm just going to do 20 minutes of cardio. And then, you know, the next day, 20 minutes. And then the third day, do, you know, 30 minutes and, you know, go look at the weights and don't be intimidated. Yeah. Just get in there and do something. I like that. Uh, and one little we th- only have one body. That's that's you know good, we have one body. If we don't take care of it, nobody else is going that's to. That's that's a good point. You know, it's just not. So let me ask you this now, because this you know you say you do hair, and do you do like hair extensions and all that good stuff? Or I do. I'm here in my studio right now. Uh, I specialize in hair extensions. Okay. I have my own line of hair and my own label, uh, and I have a, a full clientele. I'm always taking new ones, and um, I love what I do. We do color as well, but that's it. Just hair extensions and color. And I have a full-time stylist that works with me and we get the clients in. And I, my line of hair lasts for over a year. And they come in once a month and we move it up. I do a lot of competitors. I was going to ask you about uh, that. And just a lot of regular people, yeah. you know, regular women that just want long, beautiful hair. Well, and the so. thing about that is going back to the competitors, what it's important uh to pay attention to detail, you know, you can have this great body, but if you got hair that's all over the place and messy, and that's all the judges are going to see, you know, and it's very important. Right. What you do that's is right. actually very important for a lot of women, including, uh, you know, people who just want long, beautiful blonde hair, and or the competitors that need to look right. Any color. Any yeah, color. Any you know? color hair. You said that <laughs> you have a label. So do you have your own uh, product that you've come up with? When you mm-hmm. say label. Yeah, my. Uh... My line is Main of Your Dreams, and it's my own line of hair. Uh, I also have a certification program that I uh, teach uh, licensed stylists, and um, it's a one-on-one or a group of hands-on, and then they can um, they get certified, and then from there, then they can purchase my hair as well. 
Wow. And I've been doing hair extensions exclusively for the past 18 years. So my name's out there. Yeah. I, I love what I do. And it sounds like it. sounds like so. you have a niche there. Um, anyway, yeah. so listen, I, you know, my mission today, I've, I've been out of the sport now for a while. We, my company is, we're getting back in. I wrote, wrote all these uh, with my uh, partner, these uh, bodybuilding courses back in the late 80s. And we had a lot of good success uh, then. And we're still selling these books, but we're back into it again, you know. So, but my mission and my sort of philosophy back then, just like it is today, you know, I told myself, you know, I would do this training that I did with I, my personal training business, I would do it for free if I didn't have to pay bills because like what you just said, right. I, lo I love it. I love it today like I did, you know, yesterday. And my mission is to constantly evolve and search for the truth. That's what keeps me going. It's fascinating to me because I just feel that if you stop doing that, you just stop growing, you know, just emotionally. Exactly. You know, so I think it's really important. And I'm always looking for people, which I think you're one of them that are, you know, the real deal. You, you know, you live what you talk about. And I, I respect that. And so I'm always searching out Thank for, you. because yeah. look, the, one of the best things that you can do is to, you know, I'm sure you heard the expression, just pay it forward. You know, what I learn, I Definitely. like to, sh I like to share with other people and hopefully just to share the experience of, of bodybuilding or share the experience of getting into the gym and just doing it for fitness. It's all about sharing and being open about that. I think that's what makes this whole thing right. go, go round and round. So I, I really do appreciate. I really do Great. appreciate you uh, coming on the show, and uh, maybe I'll see you next time when I go down into your uh, into LA to see Shade. <laughs> yeah, I hope to see you. Thank you for having me. It was okay, a pleasure. all right, Good so, to see Sandy, you, as well. you take care. All right, have a great day. Bye bye.